Your Java application is slow, check out these open source profilers. This is the title of my talk that I will be giving in the following. My name is Johannes Bechberger and I'm going to jump right in. You probably all know the situation when you ask by others the question, aren't you a software developer? And then could you write me some or ask some website? And that's what happened to me. I'm part of the organizing team of the Night of Sciences in Karlsruhe where PhDs and professors can show their a research to the general public um, at an evening in like half an hour uh, talks and it was it was the time of corona uh, where everyone um, had to be at home and where we had the event um, held remotely and so we had the problem that we wanted to have some interactivity there and essentially we wanted to ask um, the participants or the viewers some questions in a quiz like how old is the universe um, after a talk on astronomy and so I was asked and what I did I just created a small website essentially we had a client um, that regularly asked the server hey is there any question and if yes please uh, give me the question and of course also was able to, to could also answer the questions using this client and then you had an ambient interface with which you can set the question and then you had the server um, that stored all the information um, all the data in a simple JSON file because I thought okay um, if I just use the file system um, then the file system does the whole synchronization and consistency for me so um, I thought it's because, hey, a premature optimization is the, root all, is the root of all evil, as Donald Move once wrote, and the event came, and I developed the software and was quite confident that it worked, because it's a simple software, just a couple of hundred lines of code, and the client asks all the time, every 10 seconds, um, the server for, hey, is there any questions? So I thought, oh, that's, that's enough margin there. But the event came in the evening and the server was, of course, overwhelmed, as one might expect when I'm giving this example in this talk. Um, so what was the problem? Um, the problem was that the server just couldn't handle that many connections um, and that many participants that wanted to participate in the quiz um, and now I came back to Don Wu's original quote which was a bit longer it um, it was originally we thought forget about small efficiencies say about 97 percent of the time premature optimization is the root of all evil he wrote further yet we should not pass up our opportunities in the critical 3%. A good programmer will not be lulled into complacency by such reasoning. He will be wise to look carefully at the critical code, but only after that code has been identified. And so, we need to identify what went wrong and profiles to rescue, they are the tools that you use to see what went wrong and um, performance-wise. When you talk about profiles to someone who is not from, not from computer science, you typically get like a look like, hey, uh, this isn't, isn't this something that people in crime shows do? Isn't it something that, that Sherlock Holmes does, like a profiler solving crime, solving crime mysteries? And essentially that's what we're also doing here, but we are not solving crime mysteries, but we're solving the problem on why is this application so slow and so essentially we're Sherlock Holmes and Watson digging into the depths of of, of the performance data to see what went wrong. So one of the most common ways to, vi to visualize um, some performance data that you get is a main is a flame graph. So here you see the flame graph building up in the bottom um, so you see that the main function takes all the time because it's the main function and on the top you see the pseudocode building up of this. This is the simplified pseudocode but it's essentially what the server is executing. So the main function just calls some um, initialization um, code and then calls the server loop. And the server loop takes most of the time of the main function. So the server loop has a wide bar. Um, the width of the bar is um, proportional to the uh, 
to the amount of time that it takes to execute this um, function. And then the server loop is just a simple loop that gets that waits for a new request, gets it, and, and checks whether this is a question request, and then calls the handle question request method and then handles also some, some other requests that's not important here. And you see in the flame graph that the handle question request takes a lot of time. And then what does the handle question request does? It just um, checks, is there any question enabled? And then it emits the current question. And yet it's, <laughs> these methods shouldn't take that much time, but why do they? And the flame curves also gives us this answer, essentially because we're all the time passing JSON. Um, um, so this is not a bad thing. And we've seen again, to quote Mario Fusco, when you do something stupid, it punches you in your face and it's impossible not to see it. He wrote this a few weeks back. And that's the beauty with Flamecraft. They are quite easy to understand and you see when you're doing something stupid performance-wise. And if we then um, um, rewrite the handle question request and the is current question in this question enabled and the current question method, to use something more sensible, for example, an SQLite database, then the performance of the whole application drastically improves. And we don't have any problems anymore with like 90 to 100 concurrent usage, which is really great and um, which makes the application um, usable again. And so you see profiling, the technique of profiling should be part of your toolbox, shining light on, on the performance issues. Um, it should be in the same. It, it should be in the toolbox like debugging or testing. So when you come over a problem, you can open your toolbox and see what the appropriate tool is. Um, so it's important to know for each of these um, um, techniques a few tools that you can readily apply. So who I am? Who am I? To tell you about profiling. I'm Johannes Bechberger. I work at the Submachine team at SAP. Um, the Submachine team um, works on the OpenJDK and is part of the open source teams at SAP. Um, so I'm specifically working there on the in the field of open source profilers. So I and develop profiler UIs like the one you see, which is based on Firefox Profiler. Um, I work on async profiler and related tools. And um, last but not least, I'm also working to get a better profiling API into the OpenJDK. It's currently a JDK enhancement proposal candidate. So wish me luck to and so I get it in. So who of you use the profiler? This is of course recording, so um, I chose the results of the JetBrains 2022 developer survey, and in the survey, 40% said no. So that's a, quite a large number because profiling is really important when you're doing um, to 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 know and to to have in your toolbox when you're developing code. That especially if the code goes like outside to the outer world. Um, so, but what is profiling? So this whole talk is on profiling, so we should probably define what, what I mean with this. And I'm going with the definition of the jargon file, which is that it's a technique to obtain a profile and the profile is a report on the amounts of time spent in each routine of a program used to find and tune away the hotspots in it, like we did before with our introductory example. But there are, of course, different profilers. There are essentially two types of profilers. There are instrumenting profilers and sampling profilers. Instrumenting profilers insert instructions into your code automatically. For example, you see here the server loop function um, where an instrumenting profiler would insert at the beginning a log statement that says, okay, I'm entering server loop and at the end um, uh, a statement that calls a method um, that states, hey, I'm exiting server loop. 
And the cool thing is that's quite accurate in the sense that you see every function entry and exit. But that's also problematic because threads don't really like it when you increase the amount of code potentially by a large amount. Um, and it's also problematic because it's not that fast. Um, because yeah, you're executing a lot of statements. Um, so there's another type set, it's sampling profiles and they sample. So they not, they, they don't do anything on, on every um, loop entry and exit, but rather they ask the JVM in regular intervals, usually in every 10 to 20 milliseconds, hey, what are you currently executing? So what's your call trace? So um, see it here, we ask the JVM all times, um, and then we combine this data. That's of course approximate. Um, so it has its own problems regarding accuracy, but the advantages that you see in really what the JVM is doing um, and what, what your program is doing. Um, and this, uh, and regarding accuracy, um, that depends on, on safe points. So, but what is a safe point? A safe point is essentially um, a point where all, um, where all threads are in a safe state. So here, um, every thread checks at regular points in the code. Hey, is there a safe point requested? And if yes, please stop. And the, the thread stops. Um, and so um, it checks whether a safe point is requested, for example, at the beginning of a method, at the end of a method, um, as we see here, and also at the end of a loop bunny. Why is this important for, for profiling? For profiling, um, there, um, there, there are methods that um, you can use to, uh, to obtain um, uh, a stack trace and there are methods that are safe point bias, so they only work at a safe point and there are methods that don't. Here in the following, I use this u boat which is in a non-safe point state or in the state where it doesn't check, hey, can I go faster in the safe point when it's uh, lighter of color and darker when it's at the safe point. Um, and safe point are usually used um, to uh, do things like garbage collection. So a safe point bias comes when, um, because when you now say to, to, to the thread, hey, please, please stop, and it only stops when it's really wet, and then you're getting a stack trace on the call trace. And in a fully asynchronous mode, you're just telling the thread, hey, stop, and it just stops. You don't have to, to wait till it's checked for a safe point and is a safe point, but you get it really at the point that you're demanding it. And so you don't have any bias um, which increases the accuracy, but also it has the problem that um, you might be in an undefined state and so it's less, slightly less stable uh, than, than going with the safe point bias route. And this, um, and safe point bias is especially important with multiple threads because here we want to essentially only stop one thread, but here we were asking like, please, please stop when you're ready. So we have to wait till the second thread also is, is finished, just at a safe point. Um, and here, um, for the asynchronous, we just tell it stop to the thread one and the thread two goes along. So, but how does then, then, then profiling work? We've seen, okay, there's, there's some kind of safe from bias and that we're doing some sampling, but what are we doing at every interval? Um, so we first, a profile first um, gets all the available threads, um, then selects a random subset because um, sampling all threads isn't usually possible because when you have a few thousand threads, then you cannot really walk all the threads every 10 milliseconds because this would take too much time and the performance overhead would be too high. And then you pre-allocate some traces on the data structure that you're storing, like your call traces later. And then for the asynchronous version, you like 
pinging with a unique signal, for example, your your every thread saying, hey, please ping, and the thread stops, you're going into a signal handler, and there you walk the stack with the string chronos version, you can directly tell the thread, hey, what's your stack trace? And you're doing this um, with the other threads too. And then you have a set of traces and you collect them. And then you do some post-processing, for example, the frame to generate flame graphs as we see. So, um, I, I showed you that there are two types of sampling profiles, but also there are different specific sampling profiles. There are external sampling profiles and built-in. Um, external is quite simple. They are um, agents, native or Java agents that are attached to the JVM and then use um, methods to um, obtain a stack trace um, that can be called from external agents and built-in is just directly built into your OpenJDK. Um, or the other JVMs. And here with externals, we um, have to distinguish between synchronous and asynchronous. So synchronous is just with the safe point bias and asynchronous is with the non, not with the safe point bias, but with signal loss. So I've shown you before, and one of the most common um, tools that uses the synchronous method is Visual VM, which is based on NetBeans which is a while for since 2010 and it was shipped directly with the open JDK from version or with the JDK from version 6 to version 8. Um, this is the reason why many people um, uh, use it and also currently use it because it's just the first fully available, easily available tool um, that was there. And then um, the asynchronous methods um, uh, were introduced for further analyzer. This is a project from, from Sun that started in 1991, which is essentially um, a profiler for the systems. And for this analyzer, um, they implemented the async at call trace call in, in 2002 um, and removed it like three months later, but it's essentially still there. Um, and it's uh, and in 2013, people started to use it for their own sampling profiles to write their own and um, async profiler, which is the most commonly used, started in 2016. Then there's also the built-in um, profiler, which is called Java or later JDK Flight Recorder, which is also non-safe from bias because internally it uses similar methods as async profiler. And there's a front end for it. It's called the Java and the later JK Mission Control, which um, started in 2012 and was open source 2018. Um, and it's now one of the most extensive tools in the open source world for profiling. And then many other tools um, usually use a combination of async profiler, many of them already embedded, also embedded and some, some JFR data. So how do you obtain a profile using these tools? I will be focusing on two tools, um, on um, JFR and on async profiler, but first to async profiler. Um, it's a Java agent, it's a native agent, so you can just pass it, um, tell it where it is. It's therefore platform specific, um, so you have to download it for your specific platform from the GitHub page. You can tell it what um, it should um, sample for CPU time, workload time, and so on. And you can tell it um, that it should export a flame graph or that it should export a JDK flight recorder format, because the JDK flight recorder format is one of the most commonly used formats in the Java profiling world. And async profile can also obtain, um, can, can also combine the results of a parallel JFR run. So it runs JFR on, on the JVM um, and combines in this with its own sample. So you get the best of both worlds. So you get the sampling from async profiler, which has some minor advantages um, 
and you get all the uh, events and all the other things from from JDK Flight Recorder. And you can also attach it. You can also later attach um, Async Profiler to your JVM. For example, by using um, my uh, to, by using the Profiler SH uh, script that's already present in the uh, Async Profiler project, or by using the Async Profile Loader, which is a wrapper around um, all the Async Profile functionality, and which is also platform independent, more or less. Supports the platform that Async Profile supports. Async Profile has many features. For example, uh, many events can trigger sampling like logs, perf events, um, methods, so it can do some instrumentation. Um, and it's also embeddable, especially via my AP Loader project. And it's takeable because it's also open source, like all the tools I'm showing, and it, it's a relatively small call base. If you want to know more, I would really recommend you um, to look into the Async Profile Manual by Use Cases by Krzysztof Slusarski, which tells you a lot more. And then there's also, as I said, besides Async Profile, the built-in um, OpenJDK way to profile, it's the JDK Flight Recorder. So you also pa just pass to your Java application, to your Java call, um, the option start flight recording and tell where to store it in older versions till Java 11 you had until JDK 11 you also or 12 you also had to pass the flight recorder option and then you also want to pass the debug and save points option because um, usually or commonly there isn't any um, there isn't that much debug information between two save points so for for to get to specific locations where you're currently at um, during sampling, and so you have to enable it. But it doesn't have any performance impact. Um, so just turn it on. That's that's usually a good idea if you someone if you um, want to profile um, your application. And there's also the option to use J command to start and stop um, your the flight record on a remote machine or on a machine where you only get the the uh, the, P, the, the process ID for. So I don't have to start at the beginning. Um, some of its features are that it's built into the OpenJDK, so it's more stable than Async Profile, I usually. Um, it works on all platforms, so also Windows, which um, Async Profile doesn't support, and it also works on all CPU architectures. And it um, has lots of events, so you get events on garbage collection, on class loading, and can even um, add new events, um, so you can add your custom events. Um, and there are so many events, like over 120, that I created a website which re which you find on the submachine.io slash JFI events, where you can see all the events and see all their properties, some examples, the descriptions, if there are any, um, and you see in which JV JDK versions it's supported. So um, JFR also supports custom events, and these are quite cool. So consider you write a Fibonacci server for your new math as a service server, um, where you just have an, um, uh, an API uh, FIP in which is you pass N and you and it returns you the end Fibonacci number. So um, we then would probably want to have some kind of session event um, to see, um, to record um, which n is passed in, in every session. And so we can do this um, by creating a class session event, which extends the jdk.jfr.event class and has some properties and also the constructor that I'm showing here. But when you then want to use it, you just create a new session event object and then call event begin when you want the event to start um, and then you do your stuff that 
we will be doing like in a handler for the Fibonacci API and then we can call API and then we can call event commit um, to start the event and so we then have an event that with a specific length or time duration and we can and and it then store it's then stored in the JFR file and the cool thing is that we can um, view these events in all UIs that support JFR events um, and so for example in this UI we can see that one session event for the 37th Fibonacci number took like um, 67 milliseconds we can also see it in, in other JFR viewers. And ta-da, um, you can inspect the profile. So yeah, I've shown you two tools already, but I'm now going more into the depths. Um, there are different ways to view it. For one, there's the flame graph they've shown you in the beginning and the real tool would um, output something like this for the um, Fibonacci survey example. Um, and there are also other tools that like wrap this. For example, this is by Christoph Slodowski. Um, you can go to his GitHub account um, and see this tool. And also probably linked in the manual by use cases for the async profiler. Um, and flame graphs are quite simple to use. Um, you don't have that much in interactivity and you don't also have that much ways to configure it so it's quite simple but it usually helps quite a lot and there's um there are also larger tools and one is called jdk mission control which i've shown you before which is the ui for uh, jdk flight recorder and when you open it um for when you open a file in it you see some kind of automated analysis, uh, for example, some, some analysis of the memory consumption. Then you get some method profiling information, some flame curves, some information on the memory allocations, the garbage and on the garbage collection. Um, and I started um, around a half year ago um, to write a Java JFR profile plugin for IntelliJ which is still a prototype um, which can be used to view JFR files um, and to start JFR profiling in your IDE. It's currently only supported for IntelliJ, but I'm hoping to work on a VS Code version too. It's based on the Firefox Profile UI. Um, some of you might have used it in, the, um, in Firefox to view some profiles there. So you can just install it from the JetBrains Marketplace. Um, and please do, I'm happy for some, some feedback. Uh, you can then, when you have installed it, right click on, on any main method on these errors and say, um, profile me this with JFR or with async profile. And yeah, it runs it as a profile. Um, you can run all run configurations as a profile and also open arbitrary JFR files. Um, here you see, you see some timelines, so you see the method tree, the call tree, and when you then uh, click on the method, you can jump back to your IDE, so you have IDE integration, and, and when you shift double click on a method, you have a, a source call to you below, so you can see where um, where all the samples are. For example, we see that in this example, 136 uh, samples contain this, this FIP line on the top of their call trace. And then it also has flame graphs, of course, and you can view all the events directly and get some information on all the JFI events. So after seeing how you can inspect all this and how to obtain um, profiles would you probably also want to know what the impact on your performance is and the impact of your performance is is, is small enough probably for most settings so settings so jfr in its most reduced setting where it's like for for monitoring has an overhead of typically lower than two percent in a benchmark or an experiment that I did it was between 0 to 5% when you turn on the profiling configuration 
which um, obtains more events, but not all, but but more and has a um, higher and has a smaller sampling interval. You get an overhead between one to eight percent in my um, experiment and typically below five percent. With async profile, you're getting overhead typically lower than two percent. And when you turn on JFR sync, I found an overhead between three to 10%. So when you're combining async profile results with JFR, with JFR and using the JFR sync option of async profile. So it should be typically usable for, for most applications. But take profiles with a grain of salt. Profiles are just applications also written in some code. Um, and they have the same problems as, as many applications. They lack sufficient tests in, in some areas. Um, also, regression testing is quite hard. So, please have this in mind when you're like trusting your profiler. Um, it, there might be some bugs within. If you find one, please, please, please um, open an issue in a Java bug tracker. Um, this would be really great. So we and or I can can fix it um, because uh, that's. <laughs> What I'm doing um, in, in doing work, um, so um, for example here a bug um, that I found a few weeks back um, which has a really nice and small reproducer. Um, here you have a main class and in the main method of the main class it calls its method test and the test method calls another method called Java loop and the Java loop method is just a simple endless loop. Um, and what we would expect in a flame graph is to see on top the travel loop most of the time because yeah, it's an endless loop, it runs a long time, and then we should see test and then we should see some internal reflection stuff and on the bottom the main function. But the problem is profilers stumble. So I so think profiler, the, the a thing that the API does as profile uses and also JFR stumble um, after the first reflection call. So inter um, in this this bug surface after reflection call um, changed. Um, and it's quite problematic because um, it's a bug that could have easily be found, but it wasn't and this is not really real world thing because in the real world it's it's a bit harder to reproduce um, because it depends on a few conditions. For example, here depends on test being probably interpreted. But the problem is that's hard to f to find, and it was just by chance that I found it. Um, and so, please, when you're seeing a profile and something isn't really correct, like you see here, then it's probably a bug in the profiler. Um, so please report it. Um, and to work better with this, um, you should use a experimentation technique. Um, and I borrowed this from like computer science, from the science part of computer science. Um, and I call the profiling loop. First, when we start profiling, we want to have a mental model. Yes, it could be rough, but we should have at least some idea of the architecture of the program. And also we should know like the, the large libraries, at least we should know what they are and maybe know a bit on them. So for a large library that your, your program or your application uses, then you use your model to, to formulate, to, uh, to, to create your hypothesis in. So for example, in my introductionary example, my hypothesis was, okay, um, probably the, method that the client calls remotely like this, hey, this this API that has the client, do you have a question and what is it? And that's probably too slow. And so that that fits probably in my mental model is not, I have to update the mental model so I can formulate the hypothesis in. And then with the hypothesis, I go into the evaluation and the evaluation means to write some test code, um, to do some profiling, to all this. And then with the evaluation, you can either update your hypothesis, like make it um, 
um, make it more concrete. So, for example, in my example, the hypothesis is then um, the that it's slow, um, that this whole JSON parsing is too slow, and that this is a bad idea, and just the new hypothesis, I evaluate, okay, this, this is the problem, and then might fix it, and then the hypothesis is, okay, now it's working, and then I'm back to evaluation. That tells me, okay, yeah, that's probably working, and also you can use the evaluation to update your uh, mental model. And this also helps you when the... Um, Profiling has some internal problems when you might encounter a bug because you still have your mental model and your hypothesis and when the evaluation um, isn't valid in your mental model then either your mental model is, is incorrect, that's kind of the normal case, or there might also be the cases that your um, evaluation is just wrong. But then besides um, Keep in mind the profiles aren't rocket science as a challenge to you. So um, you can even write your own. So um, uh, you can even write your own basic async profile clone that's just doing like the simple um, sampling in like three days or three afternoons even. Um, if you want to know more, I have a blog series on it called Writing a Profile from Scratch. Write a profile from scratch. So I think to Go back to the beginning. The profiling is um, that profiling techniques are good in your toolbox, like debugging and testing. And it is really important to to have tools for this to know some tools. And I would really recommend to try out async profile, reading async profile, my nearby use cases, and looking into JMC and JFR. So, thanks for being with me, and. Goodbye.